This week in AI, we've got ChatGPT leveling up twice, AI making companies more profitable, a new Pi chatbot, Bing chat plugins, and more AI apocalypse stuff. <laughs> it's been a busy week. Let's go. The ChatGPT plugin from OpenAI called Code Explorer is getting some people very excited. In fact, it's being hailed by some as the most exciting advancement in AI yet, and that's quite a statement after the last six months. So how does it actually work? Well, it lets you upload files, download files, and run Python code. Now that might not sound like much, but it turns out that those three things unlock massive capabilities. Now, some of the most impressive early demos appearing on Twitter are people throwing in large documents, loads of data sets, and are asking ChatGPT to do analysis. For example, this demo by John Backus, they've uploaded a bunch of San Francisco crime data and asked ChatGPT for some ideas on how to visualize it. They've then just said, do all of those. ChatGPT has complied and it's visualized this data in a number of different ways, all of which are pretty interesting and all of which would have taken a huge amount of time for a human to do. In this example from Wharton professor Ethan Mollick, he's uploaded a XLS file with a whole bunch of data in and asked ChatGPT to come up with whatever visualizations and descriptive analyses he thinks would help him understand the data. It has then done it. And of course, it has then processed all of that. Now, to me, one of the most impressive things about all of this is the quality of the prompts that are going in are pretty low. For example, can you try a few regression analyses and look for interesting patterns? Look at the amount of information that ChatGPT is giving back. And again here, can you check to see the effect of any outliers on these regressions and conduct any other tests of regression quality? Really detailed answers and you can check it's working. Now staying with this Wharton professor, Ethan Mollick, he's uploaded a blog post summarizing his experiences so far with the ChatGPT code interpreter. And it gives us a glimpse into some of the capabilities that this tool might have and some of the implications it might have on our existing world. For example, it says here, I've similarly uploaded a 60 megabyte census data set and asked the AI to explore the data, generate its own hypotheses based on the data, conduct hypotheses test and write a paper based on its results. It tested three different hypotheses with regression analysis, found one that was supported and proceeded to check it by conducting quantile and polynomial regressions and followed up by running diagnostics like QQ plots of the residuals. Then it wrote an academic paper about it. Obviously, this has massive potential implications for data processing jobs, so it'll be interesting to see how this develops. Remember, the ChatGPT code interpreter is still in alpha stage, so this is like prototype staging. It's not even in proper beta testing yet. We also heard this week from another company that has enhanced GPT-4 in interesting ways, and that is the Khan Academy. Sal Khan from Khan Academy gave a super interesting TED Talk, which is up on YouTube, and there are a couple of interesting takeaways that address some of the inadequacies of current AI large language models. Firstly, it's been widely documented that ChatGPT is being used by students to cheat on homework, tests, exams, and so on. But Khan Academy demo showed that their bot actually has guardrails to prevent it from giving students the answer when they ask for it. Now I have to say, this is a pretty impressive demo. Sal shows the bot doing a whole bunch of stuff which you'd expect an advanced teacher to be able to do. For example, it doesn't just help the student answer the question. Here we can see it actually diagnosing the misunderstanding that the student has in order to help them correct their assumptions which will lead them to the right answer. And it does this in a really sensitive and collaborative way. Sal also showed the bot debating the student, writing a story together, and coaching their student on writing and reading. Now for me, some of the most interesting things for this talk weren't actually the demos, but some of the things Sal said. For example, when he was talking about the guardrails that prevented the bot from giving students the answer, he mentioned that they actually had a second AI which was moderating the chat. And actually he said, in order to make the AI better, they can get it to think before it speaks. And he showed how they'd managed to make GPT-4 create this thought before it wanted to communicate something to the user. And they broke this thought down on the screen. So here you can see the AI model thinking about how it's going to approach the question. We can see it recognizing that the student got a different answer than they did, but presumably there's a guardrail that says the AI shouldn't tell the student they made a mistake, so it seems reluctant to do that. Now this slide was only on screen for a little while, but you can also see some of the training that went into building this model. For example, um, spending six months prompt engineering for tutoring with an emphasis on math. That is a long time to spend on prompt engineering, uh, and then spending a lot of time helping to fine tune the model for this use case. 
This idea of multi-layered AI is something that we've been seeing a lot recently. For example, in AutoGPT, you essentially have a master AI, which is in charge of giving instruction and collecting feedback and deciding what to do next. And then underneath that, you have a layer of servant AIs, which go out and do different jobs or are specialized in different tasks, report back to the master AI, which then decides what to do next. This is also kind of what we're seeing with ChatGPT and plugins, where you have the master layer, which is your main ChatGPT conversation, and it then has the ability to instruct a sub layer of plugins and tools that can perform specific tasks. We also kind of saw this approach when Greg Brockman demoed GPT for fact checking itself. Initially, he asked it a question question. He then got the answer back and asked it to go and fact check itself, which it did. So I think it'll be interesting to see how this concept develops of using multi-layered AI to improve accuracy and quality, and importantly, to keep responses within whatever guardrails you set. If you want to keep up to date with the latest goings on in AI every week, but you don't have the time to sit there hammering refresh on the AI hashtag on Twitter, then sign up for the free PBAI newsletter. This is an AI newsletter designed for business leaders. So it talks about the impacts of AI on businesses. You can get this free at pbai.co or click the link in the description. All right, some companies have been hit by the old AI meteorite this week, starting off with homework cheating service Chegg. Their shares dropped by almost half after their CEO revealed that their sign-up numbers have been impacted by students moving to ChatGPT. Sad times for them. Also, sad times for IBM employees. In this interview with Bloomberg, CEO Arvin Krishna revealed how they are thinking about the impact of AI on their workforce. In particular, hiring in back office functions such as HR will be suspended or slowed. There's around 26,000 of these workers, and Krishna said, he could see 30% of that getting replaced by AI and automation over a five year period, which is about 7,800 jobs lost. Now an IBM spokesman jumped in to try and do some damage limitation explaining that some of these would be not replacing roles vacated by attrition, but the point is very clear. We are still in the early stages of this technology and a lot of the best technology we don't even have access to yet. And yet companies are making hiring decisions based on this tech's capability. Now, of course, this isn't the universal approach. Last week, the CEO of PwC announced that they're actually not aiming to replace any workers with generative AI, despite planning to invest $1 billion in AI. But it'll be super interesting to see which companies opt to enhance their workers with AI and which opt to replace them with AI. Another group of companies being hit by the AI meteorite this week are Walmart suppliers, with news that Walmart is using AI to negotiate best price with some vendors. Now, this is still a relatively small pool of Walmart's vendors and doesn't include stuff like their core food products. But even so, it looks like it's getting some great results for Walmart at least with successful negotiations with about 68% of suppliers approached and average savings of 3% on contracts handled via computer since they started doing this. Now, 3% saving on cost is pretty significant in an industry like supermarkets where net margins can be from one and a half to three percent the software tool that walmart is using is this it's pactum and it allows you to run negotiation on contracts that might be too small to warrant having a human from the procurement team manage the process that it's using is kind of interesting when a vendor says that they want to charge more for an item for example the system compares the request with historical trends what competitors are estimated to pay and even fluctuations in key commodities that go into making the item amongst other factors it then tells walmart the highest price it thinks buyers should accept, a figure that a human procurement officer can modify if needed. Then it negotiates on your behalf to try and get that result. Interestingly, the article even says that three out of four vendors prefer negotiating with AI than a human. So I guess now we're just waiting for AIs on both sides to be negotiating with each other. What could go wrong? Now, in case you felt that the world of AI was slowing down, this week saw the release of a new chatbot called Pi. Pi stands for Personal Intelligence, and this is designed to be a different type of chatbot. Mustafa Suleiman, CEO of Pi, told Forbes, this is really a new class of AI. It's distinct in the sense that a personal AI is one that really works for you as the individual. Eventually, they want Pi to be able to help you organize your schedule, prep for meetings, and learn new skills. So what's it like in practice?
Well, the first thing that strikes you about Pi is it's pretty slow. The second thing you notice about Pi is this sort of layer of inane chat that it inserts in every response, I guess in an attempt to seem more human. Honestly, after playing with it, I found it quite boring. I really struggled to use it for more than a few minutes. If talking to GPT-4 is like talking to a super intelligent, razor sharp, hyper creative intellectual, Pi feels like talking to a blue haired stoner hanging around outside big Tesco, trying to give you a pamphlet on well-being and sell you some crystals. But apparently that's the point. Suleiman says, there's lots of things that Pi cannot do. It doesn't do lists or coding. It doesn't do travel plans. It won't write your marketing strategy or your essay for school. Okay, so those are like the main use cases of chatbots so far. It's purely designed for relaxed, supportive, informative conversation. To what end? Well, apparently to have more mundane, trivial and banal conversations. Firstly, I'm not entirely sure that's what the world wants. And secondly, who put this guy in charge of doing press? Bing chat has been one of the most popular use cases for AI recently, and it has just announced that it is getting smarter with some more capabilities, including third party plugins. Now, this rather weak demo does kind of show it in action, but importantly, it hints at some of the plugin use cases, for example, finding and booking restaurants through the open table integration. Well, this has huge implications. For example, that is a search that would have previously involved a local search component where someone searches their local area for restaurants and then so either visiting the restaurant's websites or visiting their booking page linked from Google Local or wherever or clicking on a search ad from a booking platform to make that reservation. All of that has just been shortcutted and is happening in the chat. This just highlights how vital it's going to be for businesses to get found in chat search. We've seen with the chat search demos from Bard and Bing that these chat based searches tend to surface far fewer options than a regular search would do where you might see five ads on a page and 10 organic results and maybe a few local results as well. You're not seeing that with search, you're seeing far fewer results. So it looks like we're heading to a world where the winners will win even bigger and the losers will lose everything. How influential this will actually be for businesses remains to be seen because it relies on Bing's adoption. Now, whilst Bing did see a search spike amongst Google users when the Bing chat announcement came, that has since tailed off. And if we compare it to the search volume for Google, awesome. but nevertheless, Bing is leading in this tech race and we can expect Google's Maggie, Meiji, Guy, next generation AI search to be taking a look at how Bing is implementing these AI solutions, what usage is like and using that to inform their own products. And finally, the CEO of DeepMind, who now oversees Google's two main AI units, says that AI progress might accelerate from here and the AGI, which is AI that is better than humans at most things, may be here in a few years. Hooray! More good news, the godfather of AI agrees. Jeffrey Hinton quit Google and has decided to dedicate his life to warning us all about the dangers of AI. Now I'm an optimistic guy, but when the inventor of the tech flees the lab screaming, then... Yeah, until next week, see you soon.